everyone. We are recording now. Hi, everybody. This is a House It Hangout from House It Match, uh, recording still during COVID. Uh, we're coming out of the lockdown now, and people are beginning to travel more. And we have a number of people here gathered to discuss what they're doing, what they're planning regarding house sitting. Um, Denise, would you like to kick it off and tell us about yourself? Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Denise. I live in Spain. We have a boutique hotel uh, where we run bed and breakfast from. It's in the middle of Spain in a region called Muthia, which is just above Andalusia. We're about an hour from the coast and uh, we have three big dogs um, and two cats. Um, we uh, like people to come and house sit for us and while we go away uh, and look after the dogs and the cats. It's quite easy because behind our property is a big forest where it's very easy to walk the dogs. Um, so we can, it is it's very easy. They just don't even hardly need to go on the lead ever. They just go up straight into the forest for their walks. And there's not a lot more to do really than feed them. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thank you. And you've had house sitters from House Sit Match before, haven't you? We have, yes. We've had two. We had a nice family from New York um, at Christmas time, uh, which was great, which enabled us to go to the UK for the first time in 10 years for Christmas, to see the family. And then the previous um, summer, we had a nice family from Bristol in the UK who came and looked after the animals in the, for a week in the summer. And they were a lovely family, got on very well with the dogs and cats. And of course, we've got a swimming pool as well. So they, they loved it here. Wonderful. Thank you, Denise. That's fabulous. Uh, Nikki, do you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm Nikki. I live in Cardiff in the UK, in Wales in the UK. Um, we've been house sitting, pet sitting for a, a while now. We, we've mainly been sticking to the UK because, and the odd um, trip over to North Cyprus, um, but largely because we both uh, have been working full time. We start our big journey though in um, September. So we're reti both retiring, we've got a camper van and we're off on our travels once the borders open. So we're hoping it's September. Um, well, that's exciting. It is. It is. We've got um, we've got three, four sits currently booked for between September and December. We've got one in France, and then two in Spain. So we might wave as as we pass, or maybe even catch you in between sits. But um, sure. we're really excited about those. Um, it's myself and my husband Andy, just the two of us. Um, and it's just something we absolutely love doing. We've we've always had pets. This is the first time we haven't had a a dog and it's just really nice to be able to go and meet other people's um, furry family really it's uh, it's great we really enjoy it I've wonderful well thank you Nikki that's really lovely um, Krista and Brent in Nova Scotia please tell us about yourselves so hi there everybody yeah it's Krista and my husband Brent hi and there. yeah sorry <laughs> speak for yourself <laughs> yeah. and uh, we I'm recently retired almost a year now actually and my husband it will be soon so we too are looking at what that's like for us uh, in retirement we have uh, an Airstream trailer up in Western Canada and we have family out there so we intend on spending some time in Western Canada but we also are looking at uh, potentially a, a five or six month away home somewhere and we'd like to explore where that away home forever may be. So we were hoping that through house sitters, we too have a small dog. Uh, well, she'll probably be medium sized by the time she's done. She's about six months old right now. So we would be traveling with our dog and we would like the opportunity to be able to house sit at some other parts of the world. Want to add anything, baby? No, just uh, we love animals and uh, we love exploring and uh, traveling around. So I thought this would be a great, uh, great way to uh, accomplish all the things that we're passionate about. Well, that sounds like an exciting plan, actually. Well done. Brilliant. I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and Karen, welcome to our group. Karen, tell us about yourself. Hi, apologies. A little bit late. Um, I am Karen. I live in Beaconsfield in the south of England. Um, I'm originally from the north of England, so I have a little bit of a wonky accent. And uh, I know a little bit about how set match because I've done a little bit of work with, with Lamia in the past, but I'm quite keen. I've got two teen kids, well, a teen and a 20 year old, and I'm keen to sort of, you know, I'm, I'm on my own. I'd like to go and do a few more, a few house sets myself. So I'm a kind of a newbie house set myself, but I'm keen to know, um, especially the far away places will be, be interesting. 
Uh, at the moment, I'm feeling that I need to sort of maybe look in the UK. Um, but you never know. I think Spain would be quite interesting. Um, so I'm just trying to get to know more about the actual nitty gritty of, of house sitting and how it might work for me. And I, I'm a freelancer in marketing, so I can work as a, as a nomad, really, Wi-Fi permitting. So I'm quite keen on, on doing that. So that's my background, really. Great. Thanks, Karen. And Kelly, welcome back. Tell Hi. us about yourself, Kelly. <laughs> I'm Kelly hayes Reed, and I just uh, took a house sit in Edinburgh. So I'm up here in Scotland uh, for the next six months or so possibly longer uh, because the homeowners can't leave where they are and come back here. So I'm here without pets, which is um, an interesting experience. This is my first house sit in 10 years where I haven't had a pet. And I've been house sitting full time for the last 10 years. So I'm originally uh, from the United States, most recently Los Angeles. I'm a digital nomad like Karen, so I can work anywhere in the world and have. And I'm a writer and a journalist. And uh, can I show my book? Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote how to become a house sitter insider tips from the house sit diva wow so you've got everything you need to know about getting started excellent and, uh, upping your game as a house sitter so that's my story so I, I'm looking forward to getting out and exploring Edinburgh once it opens up but right now I'm I'm sort of here housebound like most everybody else but it's a great charming city so far well, actually, that's a lovely length of house at six months, very unusual, but that really enables you to get into the community, doesn't it? And kind of get to know not just the lay the lie of the land, but also the people and you, know, you perhaps even volunteer for community groups. I mean, have you thought about how to perhaps get to know the community a bit better? I have. Of course, everything's on lockdown right now, so it's a little difficult. But when, when I've house sat in other places and other parts of the world, I've done things like volunteer to teach village children how to speak English. Um, I've worked with, uh, when I was house sitting in Berlin several years ago at the height of the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, I went down to the refugee center there and, and, you know, just handed out water and bottles to, bottles of water and sandwiches to refugees, and then ended up writing a story about them as a journalist. So I've had a number of different experiences like that in some of the places where I've house sat, and it's, um, yeah, six months is a fantastic time, so I can't wait for things to open up a little bit and have a chance to do that. And when it's appropriate, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this house sit came about because it's a really unique story. Okay, well, that would be great, actually. It'd be good to hear that. Um, can I just point the sort of uh, conversation at Krista and Brent? So you've not house sat before, but you're interested and think it's a great way to travel. And you're going to take your dog with you. So that I, did I understand all of that correctly? That's correct, yeah. Okay, fabulous. And are you keen to start maybe sort of in Canada stateside just to kind of get the feel for traveling around with your dog? Well, I think we're, we're pretty open. Uh, uh, our dog actually is an emotional support dog, so she's able to travel with us quite easy, which is very convenient. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't believe we'll be able to do anything international until 2021, though. I don't think that the uh, borders in Canada will open up for flights before then. So, you know, even hopefully potentially to start out in Western Canada to do some stuff. And we are quite interested as well in, in Mexico. There's some areas down there, San Miguel. Uh, there's some other, I think that you're familiar with, hey? Yeah, we've traveled quite a bit uh, through my work. We've traveled to, to pretty much all corners of the world. And uh, again, it's part of our DNA. We like it and uh, thought this would be a great way to get out and do a bit of exploring and, um, yeah. And not spend the winters in Nova Scotia, Canada. <laughs> Nova Scotia is a beautiful place. It can get, uh, get a little chilly in about December. I'm a Vancouver guy, so uh, yeah. hence why we have the Airstream trailer out in Vancouver. We still get out there a fair amount. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Actually, one of our favorite uh, house sitters uh, is an Icelandic security guard, and he contacted me when he turned 60 and said, I never want to spend another winter in Iceland again. You have to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, for six years we've been doing that. We've been helping him find new warm lo warmer locations, let's put it that way. Well, we would sit in Iceland because we've been, we've been there uh, before beautiful. and uh, just mm -hmm. absolutely loved it. So. Uh, we'd probably even try it in the winter, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would do it in the I winter. I think we'd even try it in the winter, even if it was super cold. It's such a, such beautiful, a great beautiful country. Okay, well, yeah. we, we do have a couple of homeowners in Iceland, so I'll, I'll bear that in mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Denise, can I invite you to tell us a little bit about um, how you started on the house sitting journey? Because as, as a boutique hotel owner, uh, it must be a challenge to find responsible people to kind of just look after things while you're away. 
Um, what do you look for in a house sitter and how did you get started with, well, with us, House to Match? Um, we, we don't expect any of the people that come and stay with us to, to run the hotel. Literally, um, they're living in, in the hotel. It's our house as well. Um, it is the, the buildings are divided into two really. There's one side that we use as the hotel when we're open and then there's another half that we live in. And when a house sitters come to stay, they use the rooms in the hotel because it's, it's easier, the, the animals are not used to going in there all the time, so that's good. Um, but then they come through to our bit to use the kitchen. Uh, so it's kind of a, a mix, so they, they've got access to everywhere really. But uh, depending on the time of year, I mean, as I say, we used you twice. Uh, the summer uh, rentals are very easy because we've got a swimming pool and we've got an outdoor kitchen. So the house sitters tend to love that because they're up at the pool most of the time. There's a barbecue, fridge. Uh, so you tend to be outdoors most of the time. Um, the Christmas uh, house sitters that we had, um, they were more indoors, obviously, because it was colder. We're, even though this is Spain, it does get cold in the winter. Uh, it's not as wet, but it can be cold. You need the heating on and the fire um, in the middle of winter. Um, so yeah, literally, uh, we need, we wanted to go away. The first time we did it was, uh, it was my mum's 90th birthday in the UK. And so it, we felt it would be nice for both of us, my husband and I, to go back to the UK for the weekend. Uh, it was a long bank holiday weekend just to spend with the family for my mum's 90th. So that was the first time we tried it and it was successful. So we tried it again at Christmas time because my daughter, um, and her fiance wanted to host Christmas in their new house in the UK. So we tried it again uh, over Christmas and both times have been really successful. Good, I'm so pleased. And, and what do you look for in the applications? Because I think in both instances, you've actually had families stay, which is we have, not unusual, yes. but it's not as common as a single or a couple. So what no, do you that's look right. For? I think, well, I think uh, a single person might find it a bit difficult. We are uh, sort of... 10 minutes from the nearest town, you would definitely need a car. Uh, and we haven't got any near neighbours. So if you wanted to be sociable, uh, go out for a drink, go for coffee, uh, dinner, uh, you've got to travel, you know, 10 minutes to, to the local town. Also with three dogs, and two of them are, are very big, I think what one person might feel that it's a bit of a handful to, to, to look after the three of them. Um, so I think probably couples or families is what we're looking for. It's more suitable, unless someone was very confident with dogs, you know. Um, fortunately, both uh, families that came to stay with us, the adults were more than, you know, competent with the animals, which was great. And um, all the children that have come have loved them as well. I mean, they're, they're big, furry animals really and uh, you know there are the two big ones are a cross between a mastiff and a retriever so they've got a lovely temperament but they are big <laughs> and so you know but we've had children here as young as five and six and they love the dogs they're very you know they're very amenable to being poked and prodded and all the rest of it so uh, so yeah we're, we're open as long as someone's confident with the dogs then it's not a problem I don't think Great, wonderful. Well, that, that's actually really useful to know. Um, uh, now, Kelly, you've house sat for 10 years back to back. I mean, that's really impressive in terms of a record. Have you ever had a challenge where you thought, hmm, I'll take this on, but I'm not sure how it's going to work? And any sort of interesting stories around a, a tough assignment that sort of turned out okay in the end, but you know, you thought about the challenge before you took it on? Well, I think Denise raises a really good point that when you've got multiple animals, sometimes it is more helpful to have a partner or family there. Um, I did take a house sit last summer in Réunion. I'm sorry, I don't speak French, so I know I just slaughtered that. Uh, it's a French island in the Indian Ocean, uh, just east of Madagascar. And uh, it was for two dogs, medium-sized dogs and four cats. And I thought, well, you know, two medium-sized dogs, I could walk together and usually they were walked off lead. Um, but I, I, you know, gave that a, some, a second thought too, whether or not I, as a single woman, how I do with that experience. And it turned out it was fine. 
Um, the dogs were very well behaved and extremely lovable. Um, it got a little crowded in bed, but uh, besides that, it was, you know, uh, it, it was it was absolutely fine. But I also worried about how uh, secluded it was because this was a, um, a home that was not right in the center of the city. But the homeowner let me use her car, so I was able to get around. And one of the things that helped is she introduced me to one of her girlfriends who became a really dear friend of mine, and we paled around quite a bit. And um, I think that, of all of the house sits that I've had, the ones that I've enjoyed the most, quite honestly, besides the pets, have been where the homeowners have introduced me to a friend of theirs. And, and that's given me kind of an insider view of the area and somebody to hang, you know, to hang out with a little bit. So, um, <clears throat> so it was really interesting to hear what you had to say, Denise, about what you look, in, look at for a house sitter, because I think, I think that's really smart to think about your animals' needs and who would be able to provide best for them. I think um, one of the uh, one of the interesting things I've learned certainly while running House Sit Match is that um, if people do normally think about not just the brief and their animals and the situation. Maybe there's a lot of gardening required, especially in the hot countries. You have to look after non-irrigated sort of uh, flower beds and so on, and and that can be quite a lot of work. You know, people think about gardening in their own country and think, oh, that'll be easy. I can do that. I do that at home. But actually, if there are terraces, if there are, you know, watering cans to carry four times a day sometimes. I have had conversations with house sitters after house sit where I said, well, is a hot country. They did say it wasn't irrigated and so on. So I think it is really important to think about the responsibilities you're taking on. And most people do, to be honest, you know, I'm, conversations where there have been challenges. Really, I can count on one hand in all those years. So um, but it is worth thinking about for anyone who hasn't done it before. Yes, Kelly. Yeah, Lamy, I think some other things to put in that category are things like, you know, are you going to be required to um, shovel snow if you're going to Iceland in the winter, for example? <laughs> uh, you know, and what, what that would entail. Um, or if there's, um, if people have some unusual stairs or it's difficult or real challenging to get up to their, their particular house. Um, or if you're on, you know, if it's a, you're on the fifth floor and there's no elevator in the in the building, those are I think good things to reveal. And if you're a house sitter and you have some challenges around that, those are good things to reveal as well, so that you, you know, you end up with a good match. Yes, no, that's that's a very good point. And uh, we have a document that we um, offer a template uh, that we offer homeowners called the Easy Sit Guidelines, where we try and prompt, um, you know, the questions that house sitters might ask, so that the homeowner is equipped. Um, you know, when they hand over their brief, they, they've thought about all the questions. And likewise, for house sitters, you know, there's an agreement, which means that the homeowner, you know, if you've committed both of you to date, start date, end date, you know, what the person will do, the responsibilities. I think it's good to have those conversations beforehand and to semi-formalize them so that, you know, you've got, you may not remember some of the details that people give you, but if they're written down by the homeowner and you've signed on it, you know that that's the case. Actually, it equips you. You know, it gives you confidence that no, no, they're coming back on the 5th of September or whatever it is. That's what they said. I've got their arrival times here and so on. It, I think it really does help to have all that information laid out. Um, I had one fabulous homeowner who would give me all her dog passports with all their vaccinations, um, the English speaking vet and the French speaking vet, you know, whoever was available on the day and their rota. I mean, she was so thorough in her briefing. It was almost too much, but actually in one instance, it was useful. So I was glad I had it. So it is good to have those things, I think, ready and, and to have. Um, does anyone, yes, didn't, uh, Nikki? I was just gonna say that um, it, it, it is really useful to have that. And especially if, like for us, we're planning on doing a number of shorter sits rather than long sits, is because what I found is when we, we, we did a run of sits last year locally, but it was sort of starting to, households were starting to blend into each other by the time we'd done a few so having that really clear document in front of you is is really helpful and also there are some difficult questions that I think are sometimes easier if people write it down so the lady that we sit out for in North Cyprus her dog is uh, 16 this year and we've been sitting for her for four years and the dog's got a heart condition and every year we have to have that conversation which is much easier for her if she can write it down rather because she said to me I don't even want to talk about what happens if 
the dog dies while I'm away. But I do because each that you know it's my responsibility for her family members. So um, it's much easier for her if she just writes it down and says. I mean, we know now because we've done it four times. But that first time was really difficult because she didn't want to talk about it. It was much easier for her to write it. And it's a really sensitive subject. So I think some of the things, it's not just about the practicalities, but it's about the things that are difficult sometimes for people as well. Now, I think it's a very good point, actually. The document kind of neutralizes it somehow, doesn't it? Yeah. But it equips you and it's a practical step. Yeah. Lamia. Um, so, yes. I think we probably have a lot of questions that maybe if there's an opportunity, we could speak to you directly offline because I know that a lot of the people that are here have either done the house sitting or because, I mean, I'd certainly be interested in the, the areas that you can, the length of time. Uh, I'd also want to know where we'd be traveling international. If the people that we were sitting for got held up, how would that impact us? If our flights then were impacted, like there's, I'm sure a lot of things that we would really, are there the opportunities internationally, uh, can we bring our dog? Are people okay with that? If you as well have a smaller dog that you're bringing along, like I think there's lots of things that we'd be interested in. And I know that we're looking at hopefully January starting on a bit of a roll. We, we don't want to tie ourselves down for at least a year. We would love to go and try a bunch of different places for about a year. And we've got the, the ability to do that. Fortunately, we can leave the home that we, we have a grown daughter that's in our home here. So she can stay at this one. We don't have to worry about that. So I think we have lots of questions that obviously probably this is not the best platform, but maybe we can take a lot of those offline with you. I'm more than happy to take a private call at any time, but feel free to ask a question because I think not everyone's done house sit. So Karen hasn't done a house sit, but is keen to house sit. Um, but we do have experienced people who might be able to answer better than I. So feel free to ask any questions you want, actually. So is there like an average length of time or does it really vary? Well, on our site, and each site has a different kind of behavior pattern, but on our site, um, we, our average length of sit is actually three weeks. And that's only because we do have a few long-term sits. Um, it's rare that we have sits of a weekend or shorter. So they tend to be four or five days if it's a weekend. The homeowner will kindly add a day either side. Um, and people often like you to come and prepare by staying a day at least in order to get used to the animals and vice versa. So, but I would say the average sit is about three weeks, um, but the dates are always published on the adverts and you can specify if you want or prefer um, house sits of say, you know, two weeks bus. So you can specify that as well on our site. So you become so, a member. Right? You need to join us a member. member. That's right. There's a small annual fee, which covers your ID checking and everybody's ID checked, including homeowners. Uh, and then we ask house sitters to voluntarily do a police check or background check online. If you have one already that is in date, then please share that with me and then I'll mark your account as, as um, validated. Um, if, but otherwise you can have um, a police check done from anywhere in the world about wherever you've come from through our system. We have that ability. Okay. And then you can Sorry. put your specifications, your requests, you build a profile and so on, and then you just apply it. Okay. You had a question. Maybe. Kelly? Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to address uh, Krista's question. Um, one of the things that, that uh, is a great thing to do during lockdown right now is to build your online profile. And Lamia is very generous with offering extra months now during this to your membership during this time. Um, when people aren't traveling. So it's, it's, it's a really good time to join House Sit Match and put up your profile and spend some real time doing that um, because you won't, lose, you won't lose anything. And as people start to begin to think about traveling next year, they are gonna be coming on and looking for house sitters. So having your profile ready before lockdown ends, I think is a really smart idea. Um, in terms of the length, I've done house sits for two days and I've got this one now for six months. Um, I've had some long house sits that have been four or five months, and it really just depends on what your needs are. And, and that's always the, when I get asked, you know, how do I get started? I always encourage people to really think about what they want to get out of the house sit. You know, we give so much as house sitters, but what do we want to get out of it? Do we want a place that's going to be kind of quiet and isolated where we can get our work done and, you know, write the next King Lear? Uh, or, you know, are we looking for um, an inner city thing that's got more cultural opportunities to it? Um, so it's so like Denise's house sit would be perfect if you wanted something that was kind of more isolated and wanted to write or wanted to compose or whatever. 
could hike and be out in nature and so forth. But if you're, if you're somebody who wants to go see plays and all of that kind of thing, then you probably want to be more in a city um, or in a house sit that allows you to be away from the animals for several hours at a time. Cause that's another thing to consider. So it, it really, you can do it for a weekend or for several weeks or several months. For me, the sweet spot, for me personally, the sweet spot is about three weeks because that's long enough for me to get to know the area and feel comfortable and confident with the animals in the home and, and kind of enjoy myself. But it's not so long that if I'm in a house sit that for whatever reason just isn't the perfect house sit for me, it's, it's not so long that I'm st I feel stuck. You know, three weeks is short enough for, for me to persevere if I need to. And it's international, I, I guess. You've gone all sorts of like in Canada too? Is it everywhere? I don't, I don't even know. Yeah, it's, you it's know. everywhere. I've, I've house sat several countries in, in Africa, um, oh. Southeast Asia, China. Um, I had a regular house sit up until recently in Mexico in Ajijic, the Lake Chapala area, um, and uh, um, throughout the U.S. So wow. I've house sat in, I don't know, I, I ended up one time Lamia with you and I can't remember what it was, a dozen countries or something. Oh. Uh, so, you know, it's been, been quite a bit throughout Europe as well. Beautiful. And, and we have house sits on and off, not constantly, in uh, over 20 countries. So whether you're interested in Latin America, we have them in Mexico, for example, have them in the States. Uh, we're mainly in Europe, that has to be said. We're mainly in UK, France, Spain, and Italy. Um, but also we have them in Iceland, and so it, it, it's scattered around. But we do have them in Australia as well. So you can travel far and wide. Um, but you need to assess it and monitor it quite carefully because some of these destinations are very popular. So mm -hmm. as a member, you can set up alerts on your account so that when a new house sit, for example, Denise just published a house sit in Spain, um, in Murcia in October, um, and somebody contacted me within an hour and said, I've just seen this. Um, can you tell me more about it? So you'll get an email automatically into your inbox saying, you asked for Spain, here's one in Spain for you. Nice. Uh, Kelly, you had a question. Uh, Nikki, you had a question. To remember to unmute. Um, uh, it was really just a point linking to what Kelly was saying. I think preparation is really important and really being honest about what you want to do and why you're traveling. Because um, for us, what we try and do, and it's one of the reasons why we do shorter sits in places that we haven't visited before, is that we spend a bit of time in the area doing what we want to do which might be we're, we're not really city people so we tend to be in the isolated areas but we do the things we want to do and then when we're in the sit particularly if it's dogs um you know we're, we're there for the dogs then rather than thinking oh i'm really missing out on seeing something we we've done that and we're we're there for um for the dogs when it's cats it's a little bit different because you've usually got a little bit more um, freedom to to travel around a little bit more in the daytime with cats depend again depending on the animal really but I think really really being clear in your own profile but also in your own minds and not feeling that you um, you know that, that you you need to take a sit to be in a particular place because that sit's got to be got to be right really so that you but you everybody gets the most out of it um, yeah. and, and I think with you having dog yourself you'll you'll know that part of what you'll be doing is finding places where you can take the dog. Um, when we go to Cyprus, the lady in Cyprus doesn't leave her dogs, she's got two. She doesn't leave them even for 10 minutes. Now the first year we did that was really tough because I, I've always kept them. I've never had a dog around me 24 seven and not be able to leave them. So, but by year three, four, you know, we know all the restaurants, we know all the bars that will allow the dog to sit under the table, the dogs to sit under the tables. So you, it's, it's just really knowing what your limitations are and what you want to be in that country for, I think as well, or in that area for. Beautiful. I said. <clears throat> Welcome PJ. PJ has just joined us. Uh, um, PJ Thank brings you. an interesting uh, perspective. She's actually a travel agent. And she always has some interesting insider information regarding the industry, the, the, tra the airlines and so on. So welcome, PJ. We're just talking about uh, house sitting in this time. I'm sorry, that is my phone. Okay, well, we'll come back to PJ when she's ready. Um, so 
one of the challenges I think, as you've said, is you know if you do have to take the dogs with you, um, can you take them around and about? I, I looked after four dogs once in rural France for two and a half weeks, and uh, it was a fantastic house. It I absolutely loved it, but there was nowhere near about where I could actually take the dogs because there was one big dog, and then all the various sizes down to a tiny, tiny chihuahua who was actually the biggest ego of the whole lot. <laughs> he was the leader of the pack. And the big dog was really the pussycat. He was absolutely gentle and would have gone anywhere and sat and stayed until you told him to move. Uh, but I couldn't take them anywhere because mainly because of the little dog um, who was, you know, constantly on the go. And then the big dog who was just so big, it was just too difficult to manage. So um, I had short trips to the bakeries, <laughs> quite a few bakeries, as you can imagine. But, uh, anyway, it was, so I think it, it depends who you're looking after and, and their personalities as well. I think that matters. Does anyone else have any questions? So I think, Krista, you mentioned about taking your dog with you. Yes. So we do have house sitters who travel with their dog. Usually it's one dog. Are we, on House It Match, we don't have anyone who travels with more than one dog. Yeah, but it is them. possible. It is possible, but it depends on the homeowner, and that's the most important thing. In fact, there's a video I'll send you. I'll send you the link later. We have an in-depth interview with Michelle McDines, who's actually... Um, quite famous in, in the community, the house-sitting community, for traveling with her dog. Um, mm -hmm. And she has a very particular process for being completely transparent in her profile, addressing how she addresses the, the, the subject with the homeowner. And sometimes it's just a non-starter. But other times there is an opportunity. And she actually house it successfully. Um, not just in the UK, but in Italy, in France. So she, you know, and she has a process for how she does that. So it is worth um, watching that video. I'll send it to you after this event. Thank you very much. Yes, Karen. Sorry, I just had a question because um, Denise had talked about families and things. Um, I've got a 15 year old, very gentle boy and a, a, a cute 20 year old university student. Um, so we travel on holiday together, they go with their father sometimes and often with me. So I'm just wondering, again, Kelly, you're on your, on your own traveling. So in some aspects, I would want to be on my own, but I wouldn't want to be isolated. But what's the view of, of actually taking, is it off-putting if I put, you know, maybe take my kids with me? Um, because it's not, I'm not taking, you know, a whole family of six and landing on someone's house and overrunning the whole thing. And um, it's just a case of whether I can, you know, I've got my eye on a, on a, a Welsh um, beach site. There's a lady with a cat and I'm keeping an eye on that house sit because one, I can drive to it with the kids and we'd all get the benefit of it um, as a sort of a break. And with a, a cat is more easily um, to be able to look after sort of thing as a proper first house sit. But it's just the view. The question is, how do, how do people view families, albeit I've only got two adult kind of kids. Well, Denise might want to answer that because you've actually invited two of our families to stay with you. Yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite open to how many people come because, because of the size of the property here. We've got um, five guest bedrooms in the hotel plus the two that, in the private bit that we use. Um, so the, the family, for example, that came to us at Christmas time from New York, there was the mum, the dad, and a, and a six-year-old son. Uh, and then she said to me, would I mind if her elder son and his girlfriend came over for some of the time over, over Christmas? And I said, no, that's perfectly all right. I've got the space and it's nice for them to be together at Christmas. Uh, they shared the load of look, walking the dogs and things. Um, I think it's important for the house sitter just to be honest and, and say, personally, I'd welcome, you know, it doesn't you know, it's probably three people is better than one person because, you know, you've got more hands on deck to look after the dogs or whatever. Not that my dogs are very demanding. You know, like one of the references earlier, mine only need looking after in the morning and the evening. You know, they need feeding and walking both ends of the day. We're frequently out all day. We have other business interests which take us out for the whole day. So it's not restrictive here yeah. to to disappear for a few hours on end to go sightseeing or out for a meal in the evenings but I think it's just important as you say for both sides to be really honest about uh, what each side wants and what what I expect say as a, as a house owner um, and and list things like yes you're right about the gardening 
we are, my plants need watering once a day a few the ones in the pots it's not it's a 15 minute job it's not overly onerous but I can imagine in some properties it would be but as you said earlier the guide perhaps which I probably haven't filled in myself yet um, but I think that probably is a good idea to put all those things down about what uh, you know what we would accept and what you know things that just are necessary to do here it's not overly onerous but I guess in some situations it might be more so yeah exactly. I think it comes from the point the fact that um, um, I, I did have a house sitter in my home um, through house sit match uh, a few years ago when me and my kids were going on holiday I don't have any pets here but um, but I wanted somebody in for security but I was reticent of the idea of having a whole family trundling around my house while I was away and I was a newbie as well. Um, we got a, a young gentleman, David, who was a sort of just out of uni um, and he came and stayed and he was brilliant actually. It was really good, did the lawn and everything, borrowed my bike to go to the station and get where he needed to get. So it worked out well for the sort of 10 days, but I think it's coming from my reticence of not wanting a full family trun. I, I have empathy for somebody having a whole family trundling around their home. Um, and I think, oh, you know, how could I do that? But, you know, again, my kids are quite quiet. But again, people, people don't know that my kids are quiet until they meet them or, or you know, they're, they're like normal people sort of thing. Kelly, you have I think, I think it's important perhaps to, 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 to liaise as much as possible with the house sitter and uh, beforehand. I mean, I had quite a lot of conversations, especially with the family from New York. And I think even perhaps now using Zoom or other video conferencing things uh, would help um, answer a lot of questions on both sides um, rather than it all being done by email or whatever. I think it, it, even a face-to-face -face over a video conference, then at least you're getting to know what someone's like and you can each ask the other one questions and things. Good point. Kelly, you had a, a question. Um, well, I just wanted to comment on, on uh, Karen's question. Even though I have sit alone, um, sometimes I invite people to come and stay with me. And so I always ask ahead of time the, for the homeowner to see if that's okay if I have a guest for some period of time. And um, I had a regular house sit in Mexico, as I mentioned, and, and I was uh, welcomed to allow guests to come and stay there. And the homeowner's attitude was, well, that's just more hands loving my dog. And so, you know, so it, it's, it just depends on the circumstances and it depends on how big the house is. You know, some of the, some of the flats that I've been in have been really too small to have house guests. Um, but I also want to underscore what Denise said, how critically important the video conference is beforehand, the video interview, because not only is it an opportunity as a house sitter to ask all the questions that you want to ask and the delicate ones like Nikki mentioned, you know, in the horrible event of, you know, what, how would you want me to handle it? And that's a really, really good point, Nikki. Um, but it's also a chance for a house sitter to get a, a sort of a walk around the house. So I asked the homeowner to walk me around so that I get a chance to get a lay of the land of the house. And the things that I look for when that video tour is happening, I look to see how much clutter there is because that can be an indication for me of how of the level of cleanliness of the house. Um, that's not necessarily deal breaker, but it's just something I look for. I look for where the animals are hanging out. Um, are the animals following the homeowner or are they hanging out on the couch or are they hanging out on the counters? You know, just none of those things bother me, but I know that they do bother some house sitters. So that's something I look for. And, and then I also look at the interaction that the homeowner's having with the pets, because that gives me an indication of, of um, I want to keep the routine going as much as possible. So I, I like to see that interaction and that's something that's really helpful for me. So the, the video conference is just a huge, hugely important way for house sitters to gather a lot of information besides the, the, the actual conversation that takes place. Um, and I think most importantly, and this is kind of a little counterintuitive, but I think the most important thing that makes a house sit successful for me is the relationship I build with the homeowners. And, and I say that's counterintuitive because, you know, we don't, we don't overlap a whole lot. But the, the video conference gives me a chance to see their communication style and to ask questions about how often they want to be communicating.
communicated with and what medium to use and, you know, and so forth. And so it's, it's just a, it's a rapport building opportunity. And it's, for me, it's, it's really, it's vital. And the two times in 10 years that I did not do a video conference ahead of time, I regretted it. Mm. So if, you know, if somebody won't get on the phone with me, you know, what, what's that all about? They're going to they're gonna invite some stranger that they met off the internet to come live in their home and take care of everything that's important to them, but they won't get on the phone with me ahead of time. So it's, it's really something to pay attention to. That's a good point, actually. Some um, people... Sorry, Sorry, carry on, Krista. Some people do health sits with the, uh, animals as well, right? Just yes. Oh, yes. No, we have those too. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes people are between homes. They're moving and they haven't yet sort of concluded on the sale of one house and they need someone present in, in the old house. Um, so we've had that. Uh, you know, it happens a lot. Um, so, you know, especially if you're traveling with a dog, you know, sometimes they welcome the presence of a dog really for security. Um, so that, that, that does happen. Can I ask about everyone's preparations for post-COVID house sitting? Um, I, we just published some guidelines based on government guidelines for opening up workspaces. Um, you know, the, the cleanliness, the routines, the management of the cleaning, deep cleaning initially and then maintenance. Um, does anyone have any kind of sense of how they're going to manage when they start house sitting or Denise, when you, you have these routines anyway because you run a hotel? So this is nothing new to you. You just do it automatically. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So you have cleaning products around the house, around the, the hotel. You have you show people what they need to do and how often they need to do it and so on. But as far as the house sitters go, have you thought about that and uh, what you're going to look for in the home before you take it on? Have you asked homeowners as you interview? Any Anyone have any comments on that? Yes, Nikki. So we are all house sits if we're able to um, to travel by then or all hopefully um, post lockdown. At the moment in Wales we can only travel five miles beyond our, our door so we are still quite different to England as well. But when we do move, I mean my, my view would be the important part that Kelly was talking about about the video conversation is that conversation because as we get nearer and nearer to the time I want to be able to talk to people about um, you know the what happens if at some point we've got to travel between the French and Spanish border and you know there, there has to be a conversation about what happens if for any reason we can't cross or all of those things but also from a from a cleaning perspective um, I whilst I would be um, keen that, that the owner had taken that into account is I, I, I shall certainly have all my own products with me as as well um you know we're, we're we've got masks we have cleaning products we're, we're actually when we do start traveling going to be in a van so it will it'll have all its cleaning products in it anyway because um i'm not great at public toilets without my own cleaning products and it's not i'm obsessed but i've stopped in some pretty dire services so um so we've usually got something in the car or the van um so i'm, I'm taking my own responsibility i think is the answer to that but also i think my expectation would be most homeowners are thinking about it it too and ours have all been booked pre-covid they were all booked way before so um i think it'll just a conversation beforehand will be just that little reminder really for, for yeah. both sides and are you doing one of our house sits in the southwest of france yes i've got um i think that's a four day one and then we cross into spain we've got a house sit with somebody else with another organization and then we're doing the off-grid one in oh, um, yes, yes, in spain. december so i was interested when denise said it's quite cool so that's uh, that will be our off-grid woolly jumpers and thick socks <laughs> um socks time fantastic uh, kelly can i come back to you now you have the six month house sit and you've known these homeowners before from for a while I'm assuming uh, you said you had an interesting story about how this particular house it came about why did you tell us about that sure well I you know as I mentioned before I think the most important thing that happens is the relationship that gets developed with the homeowners and I, I house sat for this couple five years ago when they had a home in London and it was a very short house that it was just for uh, four days five days um, but we stayed in touch we stayed in touch as Facebook friends you know Facebook friends and, uh, and, you know, but would comment on each other's posts. And so uh, when Don read on Facebook that 
as a full-time house sitter, I, I was kind of stuck under COVID because all of my house sits dried up. And, you know, I, I did have a, a wonderful offer from a couple in North London where I stayed for the first two and a half months. I was supposed to house sit for them and they invited me to stay in their, um, their third floor loft, which they usually do as a vacation rental. But uh, it was, that was not gonna be a good long-term solution. And Dawn had just purchased a house in Edinburgh and it didn't, the, the transfer of papers didn't happen until the end of May. So she invited me to come up here and kind of put our house in order because she and her husband are working in Dubai and don't wanna leave, don't wanna travel from Dubai because they have underlying health issues, but they're also afraid that as non-natives, they wouldn't be, able, be allowed to get back in to complete the work or to complete the contract that he's under. So, um, and she had furniture in storage. So I'm saving her the cost of, of storing her furniture and helping to get the house set up and keeping it lived in and looked after until their contract is up and they feel confident and comfortable about leaving Dubai. So that's how this, this happened. But it was it was because Dawn and I stayed Facebook friends after that first time, you know? and uh, and she happened to see this on Facebook and 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 messaged me. So it's I think that's it's amazing that these kinds of relationships happen and these kinds of situations come up. And it's and it's been through you know people like Lamia who you know really are promoting house sitting as a way to build those kinds of relationships. And I just am so grateful to be part of this community as a house sitter. It's really, it's been, it's changed my life in the last decade. Well, I think it's a wonderfully collaborative community. You know, people, I think, who do house sitting on either side of the fence, whether you're a homeowner or a house sitter, you want to help and you want people to help you. You know, you've both got something to gain as long as you play fair. And that's really what it's all about. Yep. Fabulous. Yes, Karen. So just a question as a, as a sort of newbie, I've obviously had my own house sit, sat, uh, but, and it was all clean and tidy and, and he had steak in the fridge and all sorts of stuff, but not that I need that. But when I go somewhere, Kelly, you mentioned, you know, there's a couple you didn't see visually. Um, has anyone ever got somewhere and thought, oh no, I can't stay here. Have they, have they done that? And how did they work that out? Oh, I want to hear Nikki's story. <laughs> Nikki, you first then. <laughs> um, yeah, we we uh, we did do one house sit where I think I walked in and probably cried for about an hour, <laughs> which is uh, I've, I've become a little bit more resilient now. But I think it was that initial, um, oh my goodness, what what do I do because I really don't feel I can stay here and um, I can't not stay here because I'm committed to looking after the animals. Um, so it was a very quick trip to the supermarket and a rather expensive shop of cleaning products and probably spent a couple of hours. And I'm, I'm sounding now, now I'm telling this story as well, I'm sounding now I'm obsessed with cleaning. I am not. I, I, <laughs> That's not I, a bad thing. Really I'm not. It's, um, it's, uh, and you could have a look around the flat and see I'm not. Um, but it, it, it was just, uh, I didn't think I could... I could stay there until I just sort of managed to get several layers of rather old dog food on the floor and very, you know, very, what it was, a, it was very difficult. It was really difficult. And, and I understood once I'd met the person afterwards, I understood why it was as it was, but in that moment, it was really hard because I just thought I'm really challenged here with something where I I'm struggling to, to want to stay but I know I've got to because I've made that commitment so it was to be honest after a bit a few tears and lots of bleach it was um it was okay. it worked out fine and the animals were lovely they were they you know it was it was a lovely stay um but it, that initial moment was quite difficult I'm so sorry about that this is a lady whose uh, tour operator went bust and she's in her mid-80s and completing a form on her iPad is proving a bit challenging. Well, the other side of travel, PJ, you can tell us about it as a, tra as a travel agent. You, it sounds like you've had a few cases to deal with in terms of... There, there have been a few. Most of them are cancellations and rebookings for next year. Right. Um, but there are a few that have gone um, west for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often it's the 
traveler who's perfectly capable of traveling, but they are, should we say, more mature. And dealing with things like claim forms is just... <laughs> yes, that's a challenge. And I've just uh, read in one of the French expat newspapers that uh, they're going to open their borders on Monday to mm. some countries in France. Mm which yes. is, that's quite optimistic, I think. I think that's exciting. I think it's amazingly optimistic. Mm. Um, but we're in a very peculiar situation because some countries don't want to let us in at the moment because we <laughs> haven't controlled COVID as well as they have. Um, and um, our government have said, no matter what you do, when you come back, you've got to quarantine for two weeks. Um, it's causing vast amounts of problems. I mean, people in the Caribbean particularly are seeing things get really bad because who can take four weeks off? Mm. Yes, no, it's impossible, isn't it? Mm. Hey, Jay, what country are you in? I'm in the UK. Oh. PJ is yeah. not far from me. She's in Beaconsfield, like Karen. Mm. Okay. Um, but you cover travel all over the world, don't you, PJ? Yes, I do, yes. Yeah. And I've been extremely fortunate to, to travel extensively, so, but not recently. No. And what are the borders in Spain like? If I could just throw that out to Denise. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's the 1st of July that they're opening up uh, mm. the borders again, um, but with no quarantine, surprisingly. Mm. So uh, their businesses have been really suffering here in the tourism industry. Uh, mm. There's not been a lot of government help at all uh, for, for anybody in Spain. Uh, fortunately, we're okay. We have other businesses as well as the hotel, so we're okay. Um, but it has meant at the moment we're not allowed to travel beyond our region of Muthia, which is probably 200 kilometres wide, uh, 100 kilometres deep. Um, so it's not been a problem for us, but uh, come the 1st of July, they are opening up all the borders. Mm -hmm. um, and so people can, like, we obviously get a lot of of uh, foreign visitors from the UK coming to Spain, which is, as PJ said, all well and good. You can come here on holiday, but when you go back to the UK, you've got a quarantine for 14 days and people can't afford to do that if they're working and have got jobs, etc, uh, etc. Et mm. So it's not, though Spain have opened it up, it's not helping the tourism industry here because people don't want to come still. I wonder if that was a political move by the government because it's so late in the day. I mean, it's so late in the day regarding the COVID lockdown. Um, I wondered if they were using it as a negotiating tool with Europe. I mean, who knows what they're doing, really? It's, it's hard to imagine. Sorry. Oh my They've God. been trying to set up these air corridors, air bridges. Mm. And initially, the suggestion was that there would be one to Spain and Spain have been looking at our numbers, COVID numbers, and they are cooling rapidly on that discussion. So <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen. Excuse me, sorry, I have to go. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. And oh, hopefully Kristen, it's been lovely having you in the talk. Yes, and, and we'll be in touch with you, Lamiam. We're very interested. Yes, let's set up another chat. Awesome, thank sorry you. Sorry I didn't get to see you and talk to you more. Take care, bye-bye. Kelly, yes, you have a question. Um, yes, I wanted to address Karen's question too, but first I wanted to ask PJ, um, I know that some airports like in Austria and Iceland are um, requiring travelers to pay for a swab test to see if they are positive for COVID as they arrive and that, yeah. that's a, that they could avoid the 14-day the quarantine period. Do you, do you think that will be something that will become more widespread? Uh, I don't actually know because um those tests are th their accuracy is questionable um and if it, it's rather like they take your temperature now i don't know about you but when i'm in an airport it's it's quite stressful and i'm usually rushing and by the time i get to say the gate or the check-in for the for the plane or whatever um i would say my temperature's up anyway that is just natural for me so if they're going to turn me away on that basis, um, the, the tests, um, as I say, they are questionable. Their accuracy is, has been put into question by some fairly serious scientists. 
Um, and again, like Lamia said, you know, is it a political thing? Is it something that they're hoping to uh, make a little money out of? Sorry, that's the cynic coming out. Um, it, it's still very much up in the air, I think, um, as is wearing masks. I mean, I've seen some three delivery guys today. If their boss said to them, are you wearing your mask? The answer is a totally honest yes. Now ask me where they are wearing them. Under here. That is so helpful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm hoping that tests will become more accurate and that um, I'm kind of predicting that that might be something that airports do automatically now, just as they have us go through the security, you know, the metal detector security. I wonder if that's going to be something that'll be... I mean, it would be great if it did. It really would. If it worked, yeah. If I, understand it worked, the, yeah. I understand the antibody test is actually 97% accurate, which is... No. Um, so I that's, that's like that. And so that's the antibody tests, and it's now publicly available through a uh, super drug chain of pharmacists in the UK. Um, getting lots and lots of uh, requests here. <laughs> um, so uh, who knows, maybe the tests will become more accurate. Um, yes, Kelly. And then I wanted to just respond to Karen's question about, you know, what happens if you get someplace and it's, you know, a little not quite quite sure i had i've had in 10 years on all the house sits i've done i've had three like that so the odds are pretty good that that's not going to happen um, i had one like nikki that i walked in and just started crying because it was such a mess um, but you know frankly it took me half a day to clean the areas that i wanted to live in and given the length of time that i was there and how comfortable the sit was in other ways that was i felt a small price to pay so um i, I think keeping things in perspective it sometimes can be hard when you're jet lagged and you're coming into a new place mm. and all this new stuff going on. But, you know, in the end, it, it was three or four hours of cleaning, you know, which was not, not a deal breaker overall. Um, a second tough house that I had was that the dogs didn't sleep through the night and would bark to go outside. And they, um, there were two dogs and they didn't bark at the same time every night so it didn't matter what time at night I put them out before I went to bed they would still get up in the middle of the night and they got up at different times to each other so there was no pattern to it so in the entire six weeks I was at this house sit I didn't get more than four hours sleep so oh. now that's one of my questions that I <laughs> always ask what, tell me about where the dogs sleep where the pets sleep what their needs are at night and you know and that kind of thing and when I asked the homeowners about this at the end um, cause I just, you know, they said that they slept with their back door open. This was in Kent in the UK in February. <laughs> their heating bills must have been out of sight, you know, but, I, but there's no way if I had known that I would have been expected to keep a back door open all night long, I wouldn't have put myself in that kind of, in that situation. I wouldn't have taken the house sit. So that was way back when I first started learning to sit. So learn from me on that one. <laughs> And then the third one that was tough um, was just tough because it was a dying cat and it was my job to keep the cat alive until the homeowner could get back. Uh. And um, so there, was, there were a lot of medications involved. The homeowner adjusted the medication amounts while I was there. I thought she was talking to the vet, but she wasn't. And so the cat got, um, the, the cat was having um, intestinal problems. And so he was getting sick in the bed at night with me. And, and it was just, uh. It was really hard, and, and in the end, the last couple of days, I had to take the cat to the vet and, and have him uh, put on an IV and kept at the vet's house the whole time. And so that was very stressful, but it, you know, it's not anything that could have been predicted, and sometimes you just do that. And I felt, um, this is gonna sound kind of corny, but in a way I felt kind of honored to be taking care of this cat at the end of its life and to be at there at that critical moment for it and for the homeowner who couldn't cancel her trip. So um, it was it, it was a poignant situation. It was tough for me, but it was poignant in the end. And so, you know, we just, it was a, it was a, it was a mitzvah, you know, <laughs> it was something I was able to give somebody else and that was nice in the end. So, you, you know, just ask a lot of questions and know what your tolerance levels are and um and then put the rest in perspective and you'll have a great time house sitting 
Yes, Nikki. I wanted to ask a question. It might be for you, Lamia, and Kelly, really, because I've come across a couple of sets where people are actually charging um, for electricity, not not on through house sit match. Um, and I didn't know whether that was something that you've seen commonly or whether any of your home, homeowners do that or whether that's just something that's uh, a bit of a one-off from a homeowner. Well, we, in our experience, certainly in my experience, um, when there is a long house sit in some countries, the homeowners feel like they want to charge. And, but we ask them not to do that if they can. Um, countries like France, for example, where electricity is actually very expensive in the winter. Um, we had a, a one-year house sit in the south of France. The house was empty. The house sitter came from Canada and she basically maintained the home. She painted it. I mean, she really made it her own for a year. Um, and she had a, a, a property. All they asked to pay was the electricity, nothing else. Um, so she did in the end, uh, but it was a discussion. Um, so that's the situation. It doesn't happen very often with us, but it tends to be for the longer houses because there is serious cost incurred. But I tend not to encourage it. My belief is it should be a collaboration. You have a trusted human being who is looking after your property and your pets. They will clean, they'll cut the grass, they'll maintain everything you want. Their return should be a free place to stay. But if it's a long house sit, then it's up to the negotiation, the discussion between the homeowner and the house sitter. Does that help? Yeah, Kelly. Yeah, I've been asked a couple of times to pay for electricity, and I just, um, personally, I, I don't, I don't do it. Uh, for what Lamia said, it, it's, it's a quid pro quo, and they're getting a lot of my time and effort and energy, and, and it's a huge responsibility that house sitters take on, right? You know, so I feel like I shouldn't have to pay for it. But I, um, when the question does come up, I ask people why they're asking the question, because I figure there, there must be a reason. And it's usually people in, you know, northern countries and during a winter house sit where they're worried about the electricity bill going up because of heating or a summer country, a hot country, muggy country, country during the summer where they're worried about AC. And so we just talk about that and we talk about the, what their levels are and what their comfort is. Um, but I also feel that, you know, you wouldn't leave your dog alone in your house without the air conditioning on if you were in Southeast Asia in July. So, uh, you know, it's not just about my comfort, it's about the pet's comfort as well. And so usually when I bring that up, that puts that back in perspective too for the homeowner. But it's, you know, it's a conversation and I certainly wouldn't want a, ho a homeowner to have me there and be worried about what was happening with the bills. I'd rather they ask about it ahead of time and let's clear the air. I think in transparency is really important here. You know, you must have those conversations. So this is where we started our discussion today. You know, be open, be transparent and have those discussions. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. It's been a really interesting conversation, really fruitful, hopefully informative, not just for us, but for other people too. Thank you to one and all. Happy thank house you. sitting. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good, Good luck. Meeting you all. <laughs> Good luck, everyone.